Greetings, Calvary and friends. This is Pastor Walton. God bless you. It's already August, and I wish you and yours a blessed, safe, uh, and enjoyable uh, August. Uh, we're going to begin a new sermon series today, uh, and that sermon series is called Imagining the Images of Jesus. Imagining the Images of Jesus. Let's look to God in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, please let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. When you think of Jesus, what does he look like to you? Can you see your, your own image or images? Of him, I want to give you just a second to think about that. Your own image or images of Jesus. The title of this four part series is Imagining the Images of Jesus. Imagining the Images of Jesus. Four sermons, four imagined images or facial expressions or series of facial expressions of Jesus. And I realize that the way that I would think about it is not the way that you would necessarily think about it, but it's just to get us all thinking about Jesus. The purpose of this series is in accord with our mission and our vision as a church family. We can imagine in our own ways what Jesus looked like to the disciples when he gave his great commission to them according to Matthew's gospel in the 28th chapter, verses 16 through 20, for example. And we can also imagine how Jesus felt, the pre-incarnate Jesus, as he observed uh, the prototype of our vision, Joseph, as he observed Joseph's rise from the pit to the palace in Egypt. Somebody just got what I was talking about in terms of imagining the images. I thank God for that. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Why is this important, somebody may ask. And I'm glad for the question. And the question that you ask actually pushes me to my thesis uh, for this sermon. And this is my thesis. It is that Jesus Christ is the only way to eternal life. And we see that backed up in John 14 and 6, as well as other places. Jesus is alive and is personal. Jesus cares. He cares about us. And the world needs to know his story. And this is simply another way to tell the same story. In our world, people are wandering all over looking for love, security, self-esteem, financial security, health, forgiveness, and more. All of the others who have claimed to be gods in all of world history are dead and or entombed. The only one who can help us is the only one who is alive. In Revelation 1 and 18, Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Colossians 1 and 18 tells us that Jesus has the supremacy or the preeminence. Why? Colossians 1 19 answers that question and says, because it pleased the Father. What else? Following that, Colossians 1 20 says that he made peace through the blood of his cross and is the only one able to reconcile all things unto himself. Who wouldn't serve, as the old preachers used to say, who wouldn't serve a God like that? But many have not heard of him. 
and many who have heard of him won't serve him. And that's why I'm preaching about his all-sufficiency and his care, to tell a dying world about the only one who is able to save. The first sermonic scripture for this four sermon series, I know you've been waiting on this, is taken from Genesis 1 and 26 a, where it says in the NIV, let us, let us make mankind or meaning humankind in our likeness or image. The us is Father, Son, and Spirit, the Trinity, the Godhead. If you want to read up more on the Godhead, a good helpful place to start with is in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians, one of Paul's letters in the New Testament, Colossians chapter 1. I want us to think of how Jesus if it were possible to see an image of what one would think of as a human facial expression of Jesus would look. By virtue of Genesis 1 and 25 saying that God saw it was good, perhaps Jesus' image at that time was happy. Somebody else might say hopeful or some other descriptor might be used. Then, and now I want to give you the full title of this first message. The series is called, as I told you, Imagining the Images of Jesus. The first subject is broken fellowship. Broken fellowship. And I think that most of you now are aware of where I'm going next in Genesis. And you guessed it, after original sin by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, God sent them out. And we see the same usage of us in Genesis 3 and 22. Verses 22-23 read as follows. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Does Jesus care? He most certainly cares. Imagining what his expression, to the best we can conceive of it, may have looked at this particular time in terms of the passage I just read, I think that it was perhaps sadness and sorrow. Broken fellowship with him made God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sad then, I believe the Bible teaches, and makes the Godhead, the Trinity, revealed in Jesus Christ because he is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, I believe it makes God sad today. I don't want to spoil the series by announcing the next topic, but if there's someone watching me today wondering what you can do to restore your relationship with God, I want to give you three scriptures for application this week and beyond to help you. The first one is one that most of us know from 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then the second one is from Psalm 51, 1 and 2, dealing with that time when David sinned. Have mercy on me, O God, 
according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. And then the third and final one is Psalm 51, 10 through 12, continuing in that same psalm. David says, create in me a pure heart or a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Maybe you've been watching or listening. You don't know Jesus Christ as your personal savior. You can accept him right this instant. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And you simply pray a prayer like this. You can pray right along with me at this time if you want salvation. And it goes simply like this. There is no orthodox way to pray this prayer. It's all about confessing our need for a savior. And the only one who is able to save us is the only one who died on the cross of Calvary. He was born, he died, the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. He ascended into glory, and one day he's coming back for his church. And you can be a part of that. And this is the prayer right here. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner but I believe that you died on the cross to save me from my sin. And right now, this instant, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart and save me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. My brother, my sister, young man, young woman, elder, senior, doesn't matter who you are. If you prayed that prayer in sincerity, you are saved. And in terms of imagining the images of Jesus, there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that Jesus is smiling on you. May God bless you this week and may heaven smile upon you.